Right. Um, thanks, Louise, for uh, that wonderful introduction. Um, I hope my background doesn't sort of like distract anybody, but I thought I'd be sort of living the brand as it is. <clears throat> so my name is Javid Bashir, and um, I'm from actually Calderdale. I live in Halifax, um, and um, I was uh, a general election uh, candidate for the Lib Dems for Calder Valley, uh, where I was born and bred. Um, this time around, as uh, Louise has rightly said, that I'm not on the ballot for the West Yorkshire Mayor, but I am on the deputy appointed candidates list. So if our candidate Stuart Galton gets elected, I will be his second. So taking over the function and everything that fits within the purview of the deputy mayor's role. So West Yorkshire is slightly different to the rest because it's our inaugural um, mayoral uh, transition. So there are certain things that are happening and other things that should be happening are happening. Uh, namely in terms of the uh, police and crime commissioner function, uh, even though that will be suspended and uh, subsumed within the mayor role, that's not going to happen for another four years. So it's a long transition to a complete full mayorality. Um, apart from that, I am also standing as a local councillor and, um, you know, the introduction for this webinar itself was about an eight minute talk about, you know, what this means for you. And I think I'm going a lot more than eight minutes, but I'll keep it pretty straight, uh, pretty, you know, straight to the point that, you know, this is probably one of the most memorable elections that will happen, local elections that will happen for a long time to come simply simply because of the sheer fact of the number of seats that are available at the moment right, that can switch and change the dynamics and the geography and the makeup of the uh, elected uh, from the electors. Um, but, you know, over 5,000 seats in England, 129 seats in Scotland, 16 Wales in the Senate, London Assembly, 39 PP, uh, police and crime commissioners, 13 directly elected mayors, and then you've got a raft of other things going on, like unitaries, where certain districts are going to disappear from the face of the the map. Uh, and you know, it's it's uh, it's it's one of those situations there that happens once. Uh, you know, when they say in a generation, I'd say it happens once in 100 time, 100 years because of the fact of the last pandemic happened 100 years ago. So I think all of these events here, they're all not uh, unrelated. Um, it's down to the people who actually sort of get out there, go out and vote. Um, Voting is going to be a challenge as it was last year suspended and further to this year. People have got time to go out and um, sign up for postal registration votes. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly is going to happen. It's one of those most unpredictable sort of elections that you don't really know whether you know, in the, in the West Yorkshire, the five councils of the five boroughs are controlled by Labour. Now, because of the fact of the pandemic and what's happened prior to that, are these it's going to change is the Boris bounce going to happen where the conservatives kind of sort of weighed in and sort of take advantage of the uh the success the successes of the covid vaccine rollout uh, who knows uh but the point is that, that everybody should go out there and vote for the people and the individuals that, that they have faith in that can actually deliver the change that they want and deserve um and one of the areas that i'm particularly focused on is around proportional property tax and economic regeneration i work for the university of york uh as an innovation advisor i've had a checkered background in terms of my career um so one of the key things i do understand is that um when an opportunity like this that's ahead of us right now in front of us uh, when a major change can take place you have got to go in there full throttle and give it everything you've got. Because if we don't use this opportunity, whether you agree with what's happening around the country and around the world or not, you know, it's going to be status quo, everything has been normal and nothing really changes. So I think it's an opportunity for, for, for good change. So can I pass it back to Louise? Thank you, Javid. That's uh, that's wonderful. It's um, we, we're looking as well, in particular, at, at what it means for the local parties um, as well. We're just going to go up to to Jesse, who's up in the north east. Um, just looking in particular at, at the relevance of local elections. We, we understand with general elections really sort of all going out there and, and everyone's campaigning and all guns blazing and there's so much on the plate. Where do the local elections fit into this and what does it mean for you, uh, Jesse? Um, yeah, it's great to join you t today. And, and f you know, for me, like politics means everything. Like politics means the difference between someone having a home, between someone having money in their pocket, between someone not being sexually exploited. By It means the difference between people getting help with mental health issues to break free from addictions. I, I came into politics leading 
uh, an organization a charity um called a way out and i wasn't political really um but i got i got political around issues um when i saw that there were people being um neglected by a, a, a service public services that didn't have the capacity to deal with them when I saw that communities were being completely cut off through lack of public transport lack of employment and skills opportunities lack of jobs and the place that I loved the Tees Valley Stockton on Tees Hartlepool Middlesbrough Darlington uh, was 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 not all that it could be that it, that, that it could thrive and there were stories around the globe and around Europe of places that used to thrive and were thriving again. And it felt like that wasn't happening here. And for every person that I worked with in the charity, every home that I visited with no f- food in their fridges or carpets on their floors. Um, it felt like for every story that I met that there wasn't enough hope and there wasn't there wasn't the environment around them to see them succeed. So that's how I came into politics and why it matters. And then it, this election and why it matters. Um, I mean, there is no political leader in this generation, like in this moment in history, in 2021, who will have to lead their people through the, through, through these extreme situations. The, 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 to rebuild after a global pandemic, to tackle the inimaginable impact of the climate change and to address the gross levels of inequality that plague our communities that sits on all of our shoulders and it sits on all of our shoulders because um like if not us then who and if not now then when because some of these issues there is no waiting time there is no getting it right later it has to be now and and so leading at a Tees Valley level means that I will have the power and resources to address some of this at a local at a local level it means that I will have the funding and capacity to start to deal with our broken learning and skills and training and employability system that I will have within my hands the ability to champion better housing and low carbon housing and and the building of housing in the right areas not on green fit on Greenland but on on Bramfield lands and 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 to be able to champion that the industry that we want isn't kind of um exploitative businesses that come here and pay people the minimum wage with with low protections and low rights but we want businesses to come to the Tees Valley that are based on the Green New Deal that are employing people with great conditions and great pay um and 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 that we can truly maximize the potential of the Tees Valley that we're we're more than industry we've got an incredible um we've got incredible coastline we've got incredible heritage and 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 I want us to be a place that people want to live work and play and that people will uh, rediscover or discover how brilliant the Tees Valley is for for the tourism and the creative and the cultural sector as well. And by focus on those things, we will be creating hundreds, thousands of jobs in different sectors, jobs for everyone, not just a few. Um, and, and also we'll be tackling climate change and, and the just Green New Deal is, is, is exactly what places like the Tees Valley need. And and we've got so much potential and opportunity, and yet we're we're played with cronyism. We still see too many of the same faces making decisions. We we don't have enough representation on decision making boards, and it is very much um, kind of jobs for the boys. And and the whole of our political world needs to be shaken up. Uh, we've seen the national stories around cronyism and and there is definitely that happens at a local level as well and and we can't continue to do what we've we've always done and so we need people um and and i and i absolutely believe that we need people like me who are leading change in our regions representing something different representing the future for politics the future for industry the future for places and so so it absolutely matters that we start to set a new course 
Um, and I'm and I'm incredibly honoured to be Labour's candidate to set a new course for the Tees Valley. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. We're going to come back around to questions at the end, but I'm just going to hand over now to Majid Majid um, to just take us on to the next the next part of this. Um, who's not a candidate uh, anywhere, so you can't vote for him. Um, so, so let's hear a little bit from Majid about the meaning of local elections for parties, for individuals, and why they matter for us as a, in a democracy. Javid, you represent a very beautiful part of Yorkshire. I give you that much of my favourite parts of Yorkshire, um, for sure. But, um, but yeah, honestly, it's, local elections are really, really exciting. I was, I was a councillor for three years. It was actually my introduction to actual politics. I think for like many people that stand to be councillors. Uh, for me, I was tired of asking the wrong people to do the right thing. And I was like, what can I do within my actual local community? And I guess one of the best things about um, what a council is, you actually get to see the direct impact that you are actually having on local and um, communities. Whereas I guess as an MP, you kind of like sit in Westminster here, but whereas as a council, you get to directly see the impact that you have. So it was, it was, it, it's, it's, it's an amazing, it's an important um, elections. And it's in terms of, I guess, from, from a, from a green perspective, it's really, really important for the Greens because we really um, put a lot of effort into our local election because the way the voting system is set up, we don't tend to do well when it comes to uh, general elections. And of course, with it being first past the poll. So, we are hoping to do really, really well. Like we've got to get an example at Sheffield, we've got eight councillors. One of our councillors is only one of the eight is up for re-election. So we're hoping to pick up seats, not just in Sheffield, but across the country. So it really is, and it's, it's quite important. And it's one of the elections that sadly it does get a lower turnout uh, compared to general elections. But it's, it's also the kind of elections where people are happy to vote differently than they do to the normal general elections. So in Sheffield, we get a lot of people that vote green locally, but Labour nationally uh, and stuff. So it's I think people are starting to really slowly realise the importance that the local elections has and uh, within their local communities. And of course, we can't forget everything that's been happening and um, around the world and i think a lot of people are really seeing this local election with it being so many elections a real opportunity to change things and i think the thing that i am hearing a lot on the ground is people fund want fundamental change and of course like with the recent global events with hall and um, i think this is recently just kind of like it's really kind of transformed everything that is politically possible like the coronavirus has exposed not only the deep inequality within our society, but also has proven what many people have been arguing for a long time, that we are only as secure as the most vulnerable amongst us. So those arguments, so no, we can't do this, so we can't act. It's all those kind of really, are kind of falling apart more or less, because if you really think about it, like for, for so long, for many years, we were basically being told that and the governments were, we were trying really hard to, for example, and solve homelessness, but then the pandemic hits, then we house all the homeless. Then for years we've been told that, oh, we can't borrow beyond certain uh, amounts. And then the pandemic hits and then we're borrowing absolutely record amounts. So all those years that we got told, oh, we can't do this, we can't do that, was, you know, honestly, it was complete bollocks. And I think the pandemic has really kind of shown that more than anything else. I think what was lacking was political will more than anything else. And so therefore I just feel like the realms of what and it's possible has dramatically changed. I think people are looking at the local elections as a real vehicle to be like, okay, the general election was 2019, but this gives us a real opportunity to real change things. So to, to give you another example, like in Sheffield, um, we have got, um, we've got, I, I'm pretty sure like it's, it's the biggest ever petition to force a council to hold a referendum, which is 26,000 signatures in Sheffield. So the citizens of Sheffield basically said, no, we're sick and tired. We don't like the way the local and um, council, Sheffield City Council are doing things because we had a strong leader model in Sheffield, which basically means that the leader of the council and um, which is elected by the Labour, whoever the winning group, so in this case it'd be the Labour group would elect who the leader of the council is. So that one person would therefore choose who's in their cabinet and would basically have all that power by work basically and just by the strong leader model where people in Sheffield and the campaign called It's Our City Campaign said, no, we want to basically have a committee style system where all the power is not consolidated by one person, but it's shared out between the council. Of course, the running and um, um, the, 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 the group who holds most seats, of course, will have overall power, but it's the decisions shared a bit more. So that's what 
that's going to basically uh, trigger. So we've got that referendum happening in Sheffield, which I think is just another sign where people are like, oh, we want fundamental status quo isn't working for anyone kind of thing. So it's, and of course it's going to like, can't help but think that the, the local election is also going to have a big impact nationally. And of course there's a lot of focus in terms of certain key political leaders like Boris Johnson, Keir Starmer, especially with a lot of talks of the red wall, as I like to keep calling it. And it'll be, I guess, Keir Starmer's first biggest test. And I think we'll be interested to see how that takes shape and what happens with the local elections if Labour do get a good push, like good amount of seats kind of thing. But it's, but yeah, I think like just to say like um, what Javid and Jesse, it is a really big, 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 big elections. And it's exciting, like it's, for like, I guess, maybe for a lot of kind of smaller parties, it also gives them opportunity to actually, I guess, let's be honest, it's been a complete different kind of local election because there's been no canvassing involved. The way of campaigning has been really like, I'm sure Jesse as a candidate, Javi, like you would have loved nothing more than to actually be out there door knocking, speaking to people, which is such a fundamental part of democracy and actually engaging with people, which of course, we're just having to rely on um, media and basically let and letters and stuff like that. But it's yeah, it's it's exciting and it's um, uh, yeah, it'll just it's it's just an exciting election which which has got big consequences national, which I'm sure we'll kind of get onto. But um, I think everybody will be glued to um, results in terms of like what the outcomes of it all are. OK, so we've we've been on the doorstep. We've been out campaigning. And the last time was 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 in just awful conditions, awful weather. It was mm-hmm. cold. We were knocking on the doors. People weren't. And a lot of people were feeding back to us. What's the point? So the question I have before we bring Alex in on, on this one is what's the point of three things? What's the point of voting uh, anymore? What difference does it make? What's the point of signing petitions anymore? You've talked a bit, um, Majid, about the petition in Sheffield. What's the point of signing petitions? What's the vote? What's the point of joining parties? Why should we anymore? What difference does it make? So that's, I think that's just as a, whether it's a councillor or whether it's a local mayor or whether it's just as individual citizens. Mm. What is the point at the moment? Who wants to take that first? We're going to go to Jesse then. Um. Well, there's a famous quote, isn't there, that um, that the reason why evil prevails is that good men do nothing. And and for me, um, voting is the very first step to um, to democracy. It's not the only step to democracy. There are so many things, but people gave their lives for for the vote. Um, once upon a time, the the people who represented us in, in Parliament were were. were were not diverse at all and and the Labour Party didn't even have its own party it came out of the trade union movement where the 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 situation in workplaces was so dire that firstly people organized to take on their bosses to say you're not going to send us into these situations where literally our children are dying we're being forced to send our children uh, 10 year old eight year old into into the workplace and and so people came together and they organized and they organized to create a better situation in the workplace and then but then they found that actually we're organizing workplace by workplace but then what about if some of the decisions that were made in parliament actually protected every single workplace in the country? Um, Why don't we have our people in that place that makes our laws and makes our policies? And that's how the Labour Party came about. That was our birth, to make sure that workers had a voice and someone who fought for better conditions for them and their families. And we continue to do that. At the heart of what we are is a party that fights for the workers of of Great Britain to have a better deal for them and their families. And so every vote that is cast is a vote for that party to to represent you in decision making and and so uh, for me, a Tees Valley Mayor, I'm representing the Labour Party and I will fight to make sure that we have a better deal for, for our people and, and our workers and their families. And so, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a five minute job. It's a walk down to a polling station and that's like number one. 
Um, but you can take it much, much further. And and I always remember I used to run a youth charity and, and we worked with a group of young, we did all sorts of different schemes and programmes to try and help people um, move like move on in life, whatever it was. And there's this, I'll share this really quick story of how I see as direct democracy, um, a group of young lads who pretty much their, their estate had written off um, that some of them were drinking, they were getting involved in antisocial behaviour. And... And usually what we would do or what the uh, what the local authorities would do, the, you'd put on something for them or you'd do a scheme to them. And this time I said, no, let's do it differently. Let's work with this group of young lads and actually get them involved in the solutions to their communities that most people in their community said they were the problems for. And so they wanted to put on a community festival and they said that will help bring people together. So we stood with them, supported them to run a community festival. And not only did they show up each week to plan it and take care of organising the DJs and everything else, at the end of it, they continued to want to come together and do other things that were going to impact their community for good. And the next thing they wanted to take on was the fact that their estate of social housing was one of the only ones in the borough that hadn't got new doors and new windows and they wanted to take on the councillors and just present like some ideas of how other people could stand with them to change their their situation and and so 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 democracy can also be about organizing for power in very small ways um, and and then potentially joining a political party and being that person that represents um, re- represents you and your people is for, for me it's an absolute honor and and so like the first time ever in my life that like, when people go to the polls on the 6th of May they'll be putting an, an x next to my name and and you know that that's incredible and I'd love to think that you know the lads that I worked with on that estate imagine like one day their name being on a ballot and all of their community are voting for them um, you know what a greater way to 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 really kind of shape the things that happens and, and what a great a great honor and and it is t- t- and it is difficult and we have had situations that have affected people's trust in politicians but we can't give up because if we give up in our trust in politicians then 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 we give up in in them ever representing us and that the pe- the decisions will be made by the people that turn up so if we're not turning up other people definitely will continue to and 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 that's the only way that we can make real change by is pretty much turning up Thank you. I'm going to ask. Um, I'm going to ask David now. Um, is that your experience too? What is the point when you're out on the streets in West Yorkshire? How are you convincing people to turn up and vote when they're just saying there's just bigger issues out there? I don't do politics. There's more important things out there. What's your response to that point? It's a, it's a mixed bag of tricks, really, and and I'll agree with everything that Jessie said there just earlier on there because I don't think uh, she's entirely wrong. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the significance of these elections and how people can get involved and uh, what change can be instituted at the local level. Um, I mean, for me, it's a case of when I have to give any sort of par- um, some, some uh, metaphor or an example or some rationale why voting is important. I ask them to turn the TV on, look at any of the third world country, look at those second developing countries, like what's happening in Hong Kong, which is pretty much... Uh, you know, struggling at the moment now with the way you know uh, one state to uh, to uh, two uh, well, one one state two systems, and and what's happening in the Northern Ireland with the pro- with the Northern Ireland Protocol, and I do some work in West Africa, uh, and if you and and you know I'm from my parents are from from Pakistan and so we've got roots in India and Southeast Asia, you know these people are dying to sort of literally in some cases right to actually get a vote. So we can actually sort of, the time distance between our struggle here in the UK, for example, to when uh, the suffragette movements and whatnot, when the movements happen there, is too far away, but we can actually sort of bring it closer to home and say, look, other people around the world are exactly trying to do the same thing, trying to get the vote, and we're taking it for granted by not doing anything for, for it. So there's a, you know, there's a global dimension to this, that, you know, your vote is your voice. It's as simple as that. And if you're going to complain about something, right, you've got no right to complain if you're not going to put your ballot, you know, use your ballot to actually sort of make the change that you want. So it's always a difficult one there. Now, it's a bit of a, my neck of the woods here. So uh, I mentioned earlier that we've got five boroughs and they're all Labour run. You know, the pandemic sort of, you know, done some damage to Labour because of the fact that, 
um, they haven't, they've had to sort of spend a lot of their money locally on the, on the response, which is the right responsible thing to do, but that's had an impact on all other things, like the uh, lack of funding from central government. So the Conservatives have sort of cut down and, and are planning to cut more funding to local services. Uh, and the people that are going to be affected are the direct individuals, the residents. So you've got libraries closing, you've got uh, waste household waste recycling centres shutting down, you've got the bin collections being reduced you've got potholes that you know in some cases are bigger than cars car tires themselves oh. um and so you know there's a whole raft of things um that people are going to be suffering from and you know um, and you either accept the changes that are coming your way or you actually use your vote to make that change happen so those are the sort of two real uh you know broad stroke approaches you can actually take and speak to people and try to convince them some people are just adamant that you know ideologically that they will vote the way they've always voted uh come what may literally um and others are basically seeing you know that um something that you know jesse mentioned and i think Manjit alluded to as well about the whole cronyism you know and the funding that's available there it's all down to political will if you get the right people that are willing to make the hard decisions and actually sort of you know uh, and, and stand and represent people you know it makes a big difference so your vote counts and it matters and if you don't think it matters i think there's a history lesson that we need to go back and revisit uh, and what that can be done. And in terms of the petitions, you know, some of the biggest organised events and changes in society have happened through petitions and local organisation at the grassroots level, right at the bottom, not at the top. The top is just a means to an end. The bottom is where it actually really happens, uh, changing people's opinions, changing their minds, um, having that whole community-driven approach to, you know, what's best. And, and, and this is what I see, and I, and I see this across the board, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. The people just want the politicians to get on and do what's the right thing. And I think that's where the sort of um, the, the, the door sounds shut then, because then after that, the question is, OK, what is the right thing? The trolleyology of the psychology comes in there that, OK, is it right that we spend all this money, time, resource and effort into resolving the pandemic, knowing that it's a primary issue now? But then all the other secondary issues like the homelessness that Majid talked about, you know, that's been going on for such a long time. But why hasn't that been resolved? Now, all of a sudden, it's like being uh, piggybacked on the back of a pandemic because of the fact that if the homeless people are not housed, they are a carrier or a conduit for transmission. So is, is that the right moral position to have or to be in? So, you know, petitions are a way for people to get directly involved. Uh, physical organising is one thing because it can get a bit too much uh, for some people where they don't see the real change that they want. But a, a petition is something, you know, personal to myself. Uh, on many fronts and you know it didn't work out well for me because one of the petitions that we had running was to um asking me to stand down in the general election on the day of the election <laughs> i thought at least you know they took the time and effort to do that um and and lastly why join a political party it boils down to the fact that um you know one person can make a change for himself but a group can make a change for a community uh and it's as simple as that there's power in numbers um there is a there, there, we can work together i'm more than happy to see jesse here you know uh, you know and, and i wish a look for her candidacy for uh the teesside mayoral majid what what do you think about what's your experience of coming together and making a difference and why it's important to do that do you know you raise a valid question why should people what's the point in petitions voting protests and it kind of reminds me of like, still in many people's memories, the Iraq war, one million people went into protest. We still went, they didn't take notice. And so do people do feel completely hopeless and despair? And like I've witnessed, and I'm sure many of us have like, whether that be online and offline where people just generally feel completely hopeless and despair, saying things like this government isn't listening, what's the point, we can't win, I'm giving up. But I just can't help but feel that's exactly what they want us to do. They want us to feel this this kind of level of despair but like despair doesn't work it's, it's not an option it doesn't work for me it doesn't work for you it doesn't work for anybody and I think it's kind of just worth remembering that the problems that we kind of the problems that we face didn't just necessarily come down from the heavens like they are made by bad human decisions you can argue mainly by men in suits but kind of good human decisions can be made by good people so of course like I'm not completely ruling out in my faith in politics and politicians but it's sort of worth pointing out it's not the only way to bring about change like i know so many amazing people doing amazing things bringing about change in their communities and abroad like 
Look, an example of Marcus Rashford, Rashford, Rashford. He's a football player. Look at the impact that he had. He managed to do, get the government to do U-turn after U-turn when it comes to like um, poverty and, and young people and kind of feed them. So it's, I guess, honestly, this whole, like, I always question, I don't even think that we live, we, are, we do live in a democracy as much as Britain likes to make out of it. We're the home of democracy, yet we've still got an unelected House of Lords with, where it's got hereditary members to like an outdated voting system, which only serves two political parties, basically, which it doesn't serve um, the rest of um, and its citizens to like, even the money that's involved where basically conservative donors can donate whatever they want and they'll get government contracts left, right and centre and the lack of accountability to like, and all, the, even like, look at like, education plays a big part in, 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 in democracy, but the reality of it is the system is how it is and the way it's up and we've got political parties as a vehicle of the so-called democracy that we've got, and we just have to play the game. So I'm like, it's we need to have good people in there. And if you look at like the government cabinet, for example, I guess it's local. For, honestly, from local government to national policy, the people that we choose to, rep to represent us, they don't reflect the people that they're there to represent. So therefore, you're going to have a government cabinet all from similar class backgrounds. So how are they really meant to understand the devastating effects of austerity or child poverty? They're not going to understand. And even if you look, honestly, even if we look at what own councils, they do not reflect the cities and the makeup of the vibrant, amazing cities, that, like communities that we have in, in our cities and hometowns. And that also uh, needs to change. But it does mean that we're going to have to use whatever vehicle that we, wherever that be, petitions, like, to give an example, the petition in Sheffield, it forced the council. The, the thing is, the, the council were complaining, saying, well, it's going to cost, it's going to cost the taxpayer £100,000 to run this citywide petition. Well, okay, just do it. Just do, then, just do. It. We don't have to have this petition. We don't have to. We don't have to. But we need to give power back to the people and not held on by one person. So, like that, for that case, that petition did work. They did manage to, and I think they had to get like five percent, at least minimum of five percent of the electorate to trigger that uh, referendum. And uh, so, in that case, it kind of does work. And you, we do need those uh, grassroots movements and protests in, in any given way or shape or form to kind of really put pressure on people. Uh, and and given because it's, I know Javi was basically saying earlier on that uh, people just want um, uh, politicians just to kind of get on with it. And I'm just like, well, not necessarily. Like some people don't even believe those politicians are the right people to, to be kind of uh, leading it because it's, I can't help but feel we've got the wrong possible people running the country and certain parts of the country at the worst possible time. So there is a massive lack of trust in politicians and at the moment and it is and uh, under, understandable i can completely understand but it's and i think that's, that's the role of like uh, like candidates like local parties people need to really go out there and kind of start winning but the thing as well it's it's always this um thing of like where it, it, it reminds me of a quote but i can't remember who said it, it was like campaigning poetry but governing prose so basically people will go out and campaign like all this amazing messages, this and that. But when it comes to, what do you call it, actually governing and they're in these positions of power, whether that be local governments or national, then they don't kind of follow through and kind of deliver on their promises and what they said, what they're going to. So then therefore people will get filled with hope and be like, oh great, what is amazing, kind of, this is, it's time for change, this is going to happen. And then they just, they just get completely let down again and again and again, which kind of feeds into the narrative of like, what is the point? of voting what is the point of what you call it an engaging kind of thing but the sad reality is as much as people do feel this but we have what is the alternative louise like there is no alternative so it's like this is what we've got and we, it's, it's, it's our duty to really kind of make sure that we kind of change it in by getting involved and doing whatever whatever it is that we can do basically Fantastic, right. Well, I, I got dealer's perks there and I got to ask you my first question, but we've got questions coming in from the Q&A and I'm going to bring Alex back in, who's been monitoring our Q&A and also um, on Facebook. So Alex, over to you, questions. Yeah, okay. So we've got um, one really good question actually from one of our writers, uh, Mo, who's down in Sussex, saying, um, do people think there's a point in campaigning on social media? Are we talking to our echo chambers? I think it's a really good point because obviously this year, more than ever, we've been mostly campaigning on social media. So has there been a point? And also to kind of bring it further, how do we actually make campaigning on social media productive? I'm going to back yeah. that straight back to Majid because yeah. got a bit of a social media thing 
Do you know, it's funny because this whole echo, and I think a lot of people started realising they lived in an echo chamber at the uh, Brexit referendum, when then people were just like, what, what, what do you mean? Everyone and I know everyone's voting to remain or voting to leave, what's kind of happened kind of thing. And just honestly, just a personal way to kind of get rid, get myself out of an echo chamber is I started following a lot of like, far right kind of Brexit kind of Facebook groups just to see what they were saying. And just so, because well, the algorithm that the social media kind of like pick in terms of what they recommend you is based on who you follow and stuff like that. And anyway, just another way to break those algorithms. Those okay, I'm just going to try skew it all up by basically follow, following some kind of random pages. But it also really gave me an insight in terms of what conversations people were having that I would not necessarily come across. But you're right. You can fall into this kind of like, it just kind of just, putting messages out there. But I think this way, like paid marketing, paid advertising really comes into uh, place. And so therefore like a lot of political parties and anyone that's really serious about getting a message out, they would put paid and uh, advertising into specific age groups, different regions, especially Facebook is really like ahead of the game in terms of uh, advertising compared to all the social media platforms, because in terms of it really enables you to, specifically target really minutia kind of different groups and stuff like that. So that's what a lot of political parties have basically been doing. And of course you want to like, if you know, like, obviously data is really important. If you've got access to data and know like where you need to kind of focus your energies on which age groups, which communities, which, like, so therefore you have to tailor your message for that. And social media and like just digital itself is really, really important. But also like WhatsApp, like, like honestly, WhatsApp has been a real new phenomenon. A lot of people have been really pushing in terms of political campaign because there are a lot of people are using, are in, in WhatsApp groups, a lot of people are using, so being pushing through that, but it's, yeah, it's just really, really important. And I think people are starting to really wise up to the fact that it's a crucial tool to really just in terms of getting your message out there. In terms of like, I don't know, like if there's much kind of research in terms of like the feedback, because of course you'll get uh, feedback if people are engaging with your content, but how that translates to votes and stuff like that, it's impossible to tell kind of thing. But it's still really important, especially if it's like, if you're living in a bloody marginal ward for example if it's a local election or you like you know you've got a predominantly student heavy population kind of thing but the sad thing as well was not a sad thing one of the main things as well is whatever's happening nationally will have a direct impact what's happening locally sometimes you can put to give you to give you one example and i'll and pass on to the next person but it's like in the 2016 when i was stood to get in and was i was a councillor we had two green councillors in the ward and i was meant to be the third one the Labour Council candidates weren't necessarily, they weren't in campaign because they'd kind of accepted that they weren't going to win the world because of just the way them. So they, like, as you would any other political party, you put your resources where you think the margins are where you can win kind of stuff. So I'm sort of like the sitting Labour Council actually went to a different ward, to a safe ward, so she went. But Jeremy Corbyn, amazing national profit. Uh, this is the height of Jeremy Corbyn. Literally transformed and then the paper candidates were getting elected despite the, how hard local uh, candidates about can be doing. So it's like what happens nationally does affect what's happening locally, despite how much hard work you're putting in to kind of like it's. So, yeah, it's just it's just everything affects everything, basically, social media or not. But social media is also really important. Jesse, what do you think of that? So. I don't know if this sounds odd or not, but I don't see, I look at social media as another ward or another part of my constituency. So like if I'm doing a walk around my ward, I'm going to do a walk around my digital ward um, because mm. there's so many different Facebook groups that there are, that are out there. Uh, it's kept me like, you know, I, I started campaigning for this role in June 2019 because it was a four month selection process for the Labour Party to become the uh, the mayoral um candidate so so and then so then I was the candidate the whole way through the lockdown and with an inability to to campaign or to to knock on a door or deliver a leaflet but what that did is that um I've just spent like you know a year online listening to my community and and that's everything from the skate park group to the uh, save our park group to the friends of something else and <laughs> and and actually I probably pick up 
the same sort of conversations that I would have done by walking in the park. Um, and and so 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 that social media has just been like vital. I couldn't I couldn't have campaigned without it. And and I guess we'll only see in two and a half weeks time if any of that was was useful. Um, but I think you know, Magic said you do have to pay for some of that as well. And that's slight the slight problem that um, it like none of the our political parties will ever be able to outspend the conservatives and so like let the labor parties and 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 i guess the greens and the dems have always relied on on their activists on their kind of like stalwarts of delivery people and door knockers and and whereas if it is just coming to pure paid content then then like i'm i'm up against the the uh, candidate in in Tees Valley, or the the mayor in Tees Valley, who's the who's the most expensive politician in the country by way of social media advertising, and he they, he spends more on his Facebook page than Boris Johnson and and a whole load of the ministers. Like he his Facebook page is spent more than any other political candidate in the country in the last five years um four years so so i i am going but they obviously value it um and uh, and and they wouldn't be winning like in the way that they have been if they weren't putting money into social media um but it isn't just but yeah i think we also have to think that it about getting smarter with how we use social media as well and if you're just putting out scattergun messages and expecting people to suddenly like find you and think wow you're amazing that's not going to work we we have to be much more more targeted with that and then also i think the, the the trick now that we are out and about is how can you turn social media into into physical spaces as well and and i guess you saw that through some of the campaigns during the during the last year um, for instance, like we organised like a child poverty action through social media and, and physically turned out to collect food for, for local food banks. So so that that's that's important as well, like translating our social media connections into physical and then hopefully into into votes at the end of the day. David, how about you and how do the Lib Dems um, manage the whole social media thing? Are you busy following all the right wing accounts like Magid or are you uh, are you in your echo chamber? I've always been in an echo chamber, but I was that close like, from actually joining Parlour to see how extreme things get. Um, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's interesting because I completely agree with both uh, Majid and what Jesse's saying there, right? But you know, from a, from a from a broader perspective, right? Social media is here to stay, whether you like it or not, and it's going to be fundamentally core to any strategy, campaign uh, messaging, that, well, campaign strategy messaging that you're going to have for every single election moving forward, because it's actually sort of um, created a, this new environment where, I mean, we got quite a lot of flack, I think, in the uh, early days of when we were questioning whether um, an election should take place or not, because of the fact that, you know, the pandemic and um, the, the, you know, the virus was actually so uh, prevalent in many places and the fact that the polling stations are probably one of the, were going to be one of the most busiest areas second to schools. Um, and then we were doing leaflets because the guidance from the central government about what leafleting and what, what campaigning can be done, right? So we members I know across the country, right, they were actually going out there doing campaigning and we, we really get some flack on that. But we've had to transition away to online. And I guess the, the thing that you can't really measure because it's too early is uh, something that Jesse mentioned about, the, or was it Majid mentioned about the conversion, how much involvement or how much um, work within social media to get the message out there to reach the right target demographic translates to votes we just don't know that there whereas if you actually look at the actual the paper ballots and so not paper the leaflets the blue letters the uh the leaflets and all that pavement politics uh, work that you do there you can actually sort of pretty much uh, get a good idea about what the uh, intent of the, <laughs> the the ward is going to be which way is going to vote um and you know like with any other party that you have your target development wards so it's been an interesting one there. And the pandemic sort of hit us pretty hard in a couple of ways, personally, within um, within college, especially because we had the death of one of our lords, the only lord in the Shire, uh, lord, lord David Schutz. So he was a stalwart that actually knew everybody and everyone and uh, was one of the key drivers for all the campaigns at the local level. Uh, and then we had one of our councillors that actually passed away as well, not for us, not long after. So then our whole sort of uh, balance has been that not being able to go out there and actually do all the work that we need to get done from a social media. So to use social media 
to getting last minute candidates to come in, stand up and actually sort of run there. And, and these are people, people that are not familiar with how the pavement politics works and posting there. So what I'm trying to kind of say is that, you know, that the social media has helped in many ways to actually sort of get us out, our message out there. <clears throat> targeted messages, whether it's paid or not. And one of the key things that we found is that there's a lot of gatekeepers that run the community groups within the wards. So you'd have certain town, um, you know, there's one in Halifax, yeah, there's a Halifax group that will be run by Labour because it's got the vast majority of numbers there. So the message from a, um, a third party uh, candidate, for example, is how do you get past those and get the messages out? Um, so so, you know, so those, there's been a lot of learning that we've actually had to, uh, you know, uh, undertake. Or we've, there's a lot of learning that we've learned uh, in the past 12 months. And it's like um, the West Yorkshire mayoral candidacy. Uh, it's a very similar situation that side said that we've had 12 months of not being able to go out there. There's, you know, a huge geography to transfer and uh, traverse to actually get out there to the different wards, to the different boroughs. Social media allows us to transcend that, where we can actually sort of go into the local areas, do that virtual walk around, go see the community groups, find out what what's going on with them. See, I, you know, and, and again, going back to the whole petition things, you can actually sort of run a petition and actually target certain groups of people or towns or communities to actually find out what's happening, what are the key issues. What we traditionally would do is have a survey. We'd go out knocking on doors, you know, go from one street to another and just drop surveys off and pick them up in 10 minutes. Social media has allowed us to do that in a fraction of the time. The only difficulty with social media is that, that the older generation that do tend to go out there more and vote are not online and they're not on social media. So there's a whole swathe of the electorate that you're missing out on. <clears throat> and I think that's a bit that hasn't really sort of caught up with uh, the new world of social media at the moment. Um, but like I mentioned, moving forward, there has to be, there will be a, a hybrid approach of paper, pavement politics and social media. So it's here to stay. Excellent. Back to you, Alex. And we're going to have quick fire because we've got in the last 10 minutes and we've got lots of questions. So what's next, Alex? Um, yeah, this is one coming in from Facebook, which is saying, how do you get young people to care about local elections? Um, I think it's really important because average councillor, I think, is 59. Um, older people are represented more at the ballot. I think it's a really big issue to tackle. Back to you, Javid. But it's a quick one this time for each of us. How do we get young people involved? It's a, that's a tough one because, you know, um, our average uh, is about 68 or something. <laughs> so one of the difficulties of actually sort of getting more younger people involved is actually showing them the, yeah, I, I, I don't have a direct answer for this because I'm, as, a, as a chair of the local party, I'm struggling with this myself because I need to get more, recruit more younger people. We have got some, but from um, the, 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 what has worked for us in the past is basically trying to translate our core values and our core messages in terms of what we represent about uh, individual choice and freedoms. Um, so that's worked well. Um, but okay, yeah, well, it's a tough one. That's right. I'm going to fire over to Majid, who is young. <laughs> Honestly, just give them a reason to vote. Like, like, what, what are you proposing for young people? Like, for example, like. It worked well for the Lib Dems in 2010 when they promised all the young people that they'll give them they'll scrap tuition fees and loads of students voted for it. But it clearly backfired when they then kind of and went again. So it's like literally, it's just giving young people a reason to vote, like whether that be um, housing, whatever it is. But the thing is, we have to be proactive with young people. We can't just expect young people to come to us or like, why aren't they voting for us if we're not giving them a reason to vote kind of thing. We have to give them something to be hopeful for to vote. Okay, and Jesse, if you go to the skate park, I think you might find the answer there. So what, what do you say about young people? Yeah, I would say that. I think, I think organising with young people, going, uh, working with them on their issues. And I'm a real advocate for, um, I'm a real advocate for uh, direct democracy and community organising and, and giving young people an opportunity for their voice to be heard outside of the traditional forms of, of parliament and, and local council. So one of the things that I'll be doing, should I win in two and a half weeks time now, <laughs> it's weird to say that, uh, is that I'll be setting up like a, a youth assembly 
and potentially having a, a young people's mayor. Um, so I think that it's a long term project to fix it. And um, so the first thing is, is making sure that we're organising with young people in communities on the issues that matter to them, having more opportunity for young people to have their voices heard. And then and also going to them like young people aren't even on Facebook. So like we can't and they're not not they're not going to be answering the doors uh, when we're door knocking and they're not going to be answering the phones when we're phone banking. So we have to think about that again. Uh, TikTok um, is is pretty much where most of the young people uh, under 25 are. And, and I'm, I've tried TikTok and it's not great. <laughs> I'm 23 and I hate it, so don't worry. This, there is no TikTok. Can, the dancing, the Can I just come in one second very briefly? Because you know, as you see far too often and uh, politicians and political groups say, oh, let's involve young people. And it's a lot of pandering, basically. And they don't mean it kind of thing, right? That's why it's important in terms of what Jess was saying, to really involve them in the decision-making, get them actually involved so they feel like they have got a stake in what's basically happening, rather than just basically saying, oh, let's just get some young people to see what they think and not actually involve them in any of the uh, decision-making. So it's really important that, to involve them in every aspect, basically. And also to, to, to make our young people don't care is, first of all, completely not true. And then to count other methods, oh, they're not basically engaged enough. Well, now, honestly, I kid you not, I know so many young people who would be superior, better counsellors than some of the counsellors that we've got in Sheffield City Council. Is that a shadow of a doubt? Okay, I'm just seeing a, a, a one come in, a, a quick one, I think, on um, universal basic income. Um, so the assumption is that Majid from the Greens and Javid from the Lib Dems is already supporting this. Shake if I've got that wrong. So the question, I think, is for Jesse. What's your position on a UBI? Uh, the point being is that it's particularly beneficial in, uh, in households with domestic abuse, for example, uh, predominantly women, where it gives them that basic income. Are you willing to support the pledge on UBI? There you go, putting you on the spot. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely, I've taken an interest and I've explored it and it's not something that I've kind of blindly turned, like turned a blind eye to. I just think there's much bigger kind of fundamental um, kind of issues. And, and so I'm happy for like pilots to happen, but in my role as Tees Valley Mayor and looking at powers and, and what I can do, what I don't ever want to do is like promise that I can do things that I just can't. And I couldn't find any way, like anything within in my powers of, of Metro Amenities Valley to be able to support um, some, some sort of like lab in, in my area. So in principle, maybe, but you're looking into it a little bit more, a bit more research, is that? Yeah, yeah. and the, the funding pot's available to mayoral candidates tie in West Yorkshire, I think it's about £16 per person. So that's a pretty small UBI. Yeah, it doesn't, you know, it just basically doesn't stack up. So that, that, that's, that's... More work then on that one. Um, so to come back on that, Alex, what uh, what else have we got? Yeah, uh, one more coming in saying, how do we make the results of local elections meet, um, sort of be about local issues rather than the national? I mean, I'm particularly looking at Jesse here. I mean, such an interesting, such an important mail race up in Tees Valley. But the only time when all the press dashed up, there was as soon as there was a by-election in Hartlepool, because, of course, when the government's got an 80 seat majority of by-elections, the most important thing. So, yeah, how do you make it about the local issues rather than about the Westminster sort of you know, playground. So I guess that I just, just to really sort of champion what you're, you're doing is bylines. I, I really, you'll know that I'm a real supporter of like, of the media as a whole. I think for a functioning media, a functioning democracy, we need a functioning media. And therefore the stories that are told and the importance that things are given, the media has a, a role to play in that. So, so really, like, thank you for putting on this, and thank you for for what you've done to to be covering the the mayoral campaign in, in the Tees Valley. And and I think that the more that we see that plethora, and and maybe the future of that, you know, the future of the media, we can't have it dominated by people like kind of GB, that, that very kind of right wing. Um, big machines and and so i love my lo like local local media and a local democracy reporter and i love what you guys are doing to make sure this stuff gets attention well that scores some brownie points there uh, and we've got a lot of very young writers and a lot of student writers and so that's very much about what's uh, making that happen uh Majid, we've got we're into our last minute Majid. yeah i was just gonna say terms like and um, because at times you do get, you know, when it comes to campaign literature from some political parties, they don't talk about local issues. So I think it's really, really important to kind of, in all the communication, of course, not 
political parties do want to talk about what's happening nationally, what their national party wants to do, but it's a local election kind of thing, right? And of course, as much as you want to bring different political, like, to put like other MPs and on your literature, you have to, people can't, aren't voting for MPs. I think people sometimes get confused what they're voting for. And I think you really need to put local in every aspect of that, be the literature, the campaign, whatever you're doing, of course, the local media, like in terms of like the look north or whatever, they've got responsibility. The local newspapers have got a role to play, but everything has to be focused in what is happening local. And that means talking about local issues. As ridiculous, as boring, as even though they're not sexy, for some people, and people only care about national stuff. Because a lot of times, what's happening locally might not affect everybody. So therefore, people say, I don't really care, does it affect me? I just want to talk about what the next year's tax rate is going to be, kind of thing. So I'm going to vote on that. But you're not voting on that. You're voting on local issues. Local. So I think it's just always, always focusing on everything that's happening locally. Javid, the last word is to you. How do you make those national issues local, or how do you make the local issues the important ones? Um speaking to people, finding out what the issues are and actually going out there and addressing them, uh, I guess. I mean, one of the key things that we've uh, always done um, is, <clears throat> is have a local manifesto. So we actually sort of go around surveying people and asking them in the different wards and the different boroughs uh, across the whole region is, you know, what is it, what's your primary issue there? So we build a whole campaign around that and then we actually put it on paper, we post it back to them and say, there's your manifesto, this is what we're going to address and that is it. It's difficult. It's a big bag of tricks where people just want to talk and sometimes they want to talk about the national stuff at the local elections and vice versa. I mean, I've experienced that firsthand when people are saying to me, um, you know, what are you do about the bin collections? Sorry, general election. It's got nothing to do with members of parliament. They can sort of have a word with your local council. But it depends on what, what's happening uh, in the in the world events and, and current events around, around the region. So sometimes a national message might permeate through the local boundaries and, and it becomes the only thing that people want to talk about and vice versa. Sometimes a local issue that becomes national that everybody's just talking about Hartlepool, for example, <laughs> of recent. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky one there, but it's about really engaging with the people and actually making sure that whichever opportunity, whether it's in social media, whether it's on a letter, on a leaflet or a, a big sort of banner on the side of a car, make it about that local area. It's all about localism and giving people access and getting them to have a word with, have a final say, well, not final say, but have a say in their decision-making process. If we had another hour, I wanted to ask about the impact on devolution, what this means for us in the North. And I wanted to ask more specifically about how we all work together to achieve our shared goals. But we're going to have to come back for another webinar another time. So thank you so much to Javid, to Majid and to Jesse and to Alex for organising this. And I hope everyone will join us again next time for the next Byline's Network webinar. Bye bye, everyone.